home with Fisk Planetarium. I am Ramey. I am a presenter at Fisk Planetarium. Below me, we've got Nicholas. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our stream, and I hope you enjoy our solar system tour today. Yes, we are going to be doing a solar system tour. We're pretty excited about that. We're going to take you through our entire solar system, see all the planets, learn some cool, neat things. And because it's live, we can take your questions as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them down there in the chat, either during the show or afterward, we're gonna definitely have our big Q&A session. Behind the scenes, we also have our question master, Amanda. She's over there in the chat and she will relay any questions and let me know. So shall we get into it? Yeah, let's get started. Let's get started. So we're going to start with the most studied planet in the solar system. So if you want to take a guess, because it's not, maybe not what you think it is. You might be thinking Mars, but the most studied planet in the solar system is right here. It's Earth. So a lot of people, when they think of NASA, they think, oh, they only look at space. They actually also do a lot of studying of the Earth. That's one of their primary um, objectives is studying Earth. But we know Earth, we've been to Earth, we've seen Earth, just look down. Let's go see some new planets. And we, oh. as we back away, mm -hmm. I was gonna show the myriad of satellites that we have, many of which are Earth studying satellites. And they'll uh, show us that there are more things going around the Earth than just the moon, but we will at least get to fly far enough away to see our moon. And that big circle that you see around there, Around the Earth of satellites, there's like, it looks like a ring almost. Those are geosynchronous satellites. Those are ones that stay above a certain point of the Earth. So they have to be at a certain distance so that they're orbiting at the same rate that the Earth is turning. So that's why you see a bunch of them in a ring. The other ring you see, that really big white one, is a fake ring. That's the orbit of the moon, which we can see down there. Hello, moon. But let's get a good view of the solar system. So let's zoom out even further. Zooming out far enough, we can see the moon and the earth becoming a single point, And we can see the other orbits of the solar system coming up. Oh, we have a question. Shelly would like to know, how do they make sure satellites don't collide? A lot of math. They calculate the orbits and they have to make sure that those satellites aren't gonna crash into each other, which is why we have to do a lot of sharing of where our satellites are. So that DirecTV doesn't send up a new satellite that crashes uh, one of NASA's or something. We wouldn't want that. There's also a lot of space in uh, space. So the odds of them colliding is uh, slowly increasing. It's doubled in the last 15 years, but it's still pretty small. Space is really big and satellites are pretty small. Here's something that's really big, the solar system. And we can see all those lines are the orbits of the planets, which you might remember them. We've got closest to the sun, Mercury, then Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Neptune. way out there. So let's go ahead and see our first destination. We're going to zoom in. You can see how tightly packed these inner planets of the solar system are. We're going to fly to the closest planet to the sun, the fastest, the smallest. It's the fast, place. it's small, it's close, it's Mercury. So, a question. Oh, we like a lot about satellites. So Denise would like to know how many satellites are in orbit at any given time. So there's about 5,000 in orbit, but only about 2,000 of them are currently active. And that number gets more and more and more every year. So here we've got Mercury. It looks a lot like something familiar. It looks a lot like the moon. That's because it's got a lot of craters all over it. So like the moon, Mercury doesn't have much of an atmosphere to speak of, uh, which means that there isn't anything to erode any sort of meteors that are coming in or burn them up in an atmosphere. So pretty much anything that comes to Mercury and wants to hit Mercury is going to hit Mercury. And anything that leaves a mark, that mark is gonna stay there. Specifically, this enormous mark known as Caloris Basin 
is an enormous and probably the largest impact basin anywhere in the solar system. It's so big that you can see it, remnants of it on the other side of Mercury. And it even has craters inside of it itself. So even being the smallest planet, it has the largest crater. So Mercury being the closest to the sun, you might think it's the hottest and it is very hot. It can be up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 430 degrees Celsius. Uh, but it is also extremely cold because like I said, Mercury doesn't have that atmosphere. Atmospheres can hold in heat. The second the sun isn't facing Mercury, it's really, really cold, all that heat dissipates. So it can get down to negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about negative 170 Celsius. So it's not the hottest planet, the hottest planet is coming up next. It's the that second planet. It's the second planet. Our good buddy Venus. So Venus is really, really cloudy. When you look at Venus, you don't see something like Mercury. You don't see a surface. What you see are those clouds. And that's its atmosphere because Venus has a really thick atmosphere. And a couple of weeks ago, Tara talked a lot about atmospheres of um, Earth, Venus, and Mars. Uh, but the atmosphere of Venus is 90 times that of Earth. So the pressure there is 90 times that of Earth. Um, and that means it holds in a lot of heat. So it can get up to 850 degrees Fahrenheit, more than that, which is 450 degrees Celsius. So say you were cooking a pizza on Venus and you said, oh, it's pretty hot outside, I'll take it outside. In less than a minute, your pizza is going to cook, burn and disintegrate. Not a great dinner. That's hot. That's real hot. So. The reason, or uh, we don't send a lot of landers, you might have noticed, to Venus. We send a lot of things over to Mars, which means that a lot of people think that Mars is the closest planet. Uh, but actually, Venus is the closest planet. It's also the closest in size to Earth. So there are a lot of similarities between Venus and Earth, but we just don't send things to Venus. And the reason for that is because Venus isn't very nice to us. Because of all that heat, because of that thick, thick atmosphere and all that pressure, anything we send down to Venus tends to get crushed, melted, disintegrated, any other unpleasant terms. If uh, so you were we... looking at the surface of Venus, and uh, this is the uh, 850 degree Fahrenheit surface you're talking about, Ramey, and we mm -hmm. can see even a lot of white splotches, which are uh, lava flows, and pretty much all the splotches you see are actually lava flows or volcanoes and not really craters. So Venus is not very nice. No. Uh, but we did get a few landers, and by we, I mean the Soviets sent a few landers, the Venera missions. Uh, they managed to land there, take some pictures, send them back, and promptly die. So here is the surface of Venus, the only pictures that we have from the actual surface. Those pictures that we're seeing all over Venus right here, those are all taken by radar. The radar can penetrate the clouds, come back, and tell us how far away anything is. So that's how we do any of the imaging of Venus. Those aren't actual pictures of the surface, but these are. Yeah, these rocks you can tell look extremely dry and brittle. They look like volcanic rocks. So there's almost no water at all on the surface of Venus. You know where there is water? Where is that? Mars. Ah, there used I to be. to say the Earth. <laughs> well, the Earth, yes, but we looked at the Earth already. There's definitely water on Earth. It's the only place that we know of that has liquid water. But Mars over here, which is probably the second most <laughs> explored planet, by probably, I mean definitely, um, did used to have water. In fact, it had a lot of water. It looked a lot like Earth. A few billion years ago, could you show us what uh, Mars might've looked like a few billion years ago? A few billion years ago with all yes. that water on its surface? With all that water, all that water on Mars. Well, the best way I can show you this is to imagine if it also had something like maybe photosynthetic life on its surface. So I'm gonna show mm -hmm. a, a texture that might look a little bit uh, too green, maybe too blue. There we go. Oh, I need to go back to the daytime side of Mars. There you go. So it's quite possible that this is what Mars looked like a few billion years ago. This is where we know that there was water on Mars. Uh, like Nick said, we added some green to make it look like there's vegetation, because maybe there was. We don't have any evidence of past life on Mars. It's something that we're definitely looking for. Our big three things with Mars, the goals, there's always follow the water. So we're looking for signs of water anywhere in the solar system and Mars is our really good bet. It's in a really good spot to have had water in the past. We want to explore habitability and seek signs of life. Mars, again, is a really great place considering there did used to be water there. Um, and to prepare for human exploration. And that's a really big one. We're hoping to get people on Mars by 2040. 
Um, I see there was a question, um, Ariel would like to know, when were the Venera picks taken? So they were in March and May of 1982, uh, Venera 13 and 14. Yeah, and there's also Venera 10 took some uh, interesting pictures, which I'll try to bring up here. Um, here, let's see, Venera 10. There you go. There we go, yeah. So there were a few missions that did their best. Yeah. So um, back to Mars though. Um, Mars, like I said, used to have water. And the question is, if there's not water there anymore, firstly, what happened to it? It lost all that water when it lost its atmosphere. Again, a couple weeks ago, Tara was talking about this. Mars used to have an atmosphere, but it did lose it. It was stripped away by solar wind. Um, so that's how it lost all its water. But how do we know it was there if it's not there anymore? Um, we look for evidence of past water. So things that we might look for are river beds, lake beds, where oceans might have been. So evidence of where water is. You can tell where a river's dried up or where a lake's dried up. Um, I think we have some pictures in here of what that looks like on Mars. Yeah, I found oh. some water on Mars right here. Oh, yeah, there there is water on Mars. Okay, okay. But... Uh, <laughs> Amanda's more, shaking her head at me. <laughs> more seriously... Um, here, yeah, this is like a, some of these great pictures that uh, show scientists that obviously there is an abundance of water on Mars in its past, and all you need to do is look. So uh, it's not a question of if there was water on Mars in its past, but just how much of it and how long did it stay there? Could life have formed during this time? So you can see there um, what looks like a river delta and there as well. Like alluvian plains? Yes. So there's evidence of past water flow. So the way we get a lot of these pictures is a couple different ways. We have orbiters that take pictures like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We also have landers that we've sent. We've sent rovers. Um, there've been a number of those like Curiosity. Yeah. We've got That's... a cute picture of Curiosity in there, I believe. Hmm. So we've heard of a lot of rovers, you know, Curiosity, Spirit, Opportunity, we lost a few years ago. There's Curiosity taking a cute little selfie, as we all do. They edited out the arm that was holding the camera. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people will ask, well, where's the arm? How is that really a selfie? Who took the picture? They just edited it. It's OK. There was a selfie stick there, I promise. Um, so we sent a number of rovers. In fact, we're sending another one uh, this year in July. There are actually three uh, missions planned in July to send to Mars. And the reason that you'll see a lot of missions sent to um, planets around the same time is because you have to look for really good alignment. So in July, it's gonna be a really good time to get to Mars. So we've got three going. Um, China's gonna be sending Tianwen. We've got the United Arab Emirates sending Hope Mars. And then NASA is sending Mars 2020 right here, recently named Perseverance. So Perseverance looks a lot like Curiosity. It's a lot of the same technology. I think one of the biggest differences is just the wheels are skinnier and larger, and it's going to be put in a different place. It also gets a drone. It's going to have a drone called Integrity, a little helicopter drone that's going to hop around and tell it where to go. Um, really quick, I see a question from Wittrox. Would like to know who got credit for naming the planets. Um, so Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, they were named thousands of years ago. Um, by the uh, Romans, and that's just a tradition we carried on uh, when Uranus and Neptune were discovered and named. So let's get going. Let's go to the next planet, the largest planet. Jupiter. Yes. Now to do that, between Mars and Jupiter, we can't forget about this extra zone. So in between where we have our inner planets, our rocky planets, there are two types of planets. We've got rocky planets or terrestrial planets and then our gas giants out there. So in between we have an asteroid belt and that's just a huge area where there are a bunch of asteroids. And you can see here that it looks like we're just dodging asteroids left and right and it's really intense and there's no way we could possibly get through an asteroid belt. How do we send satellites way out there? These asteroids have been made much bigger <laughs> for us here to look a little bit more exciting, more interesting. Um, in actuality, asteroids are a lot smaller and they're really far apart. So when you see in sci-fi movies, when they start going through an asteroid field and they start talking about the odds being completely ridiculous that they're gonna survive, the odds of hitting an asteroid are actually 
um, much smaller than not hitting an asteroid. Yeah, if you were on an asteroid, you wouldn't be able to see the next closest asteroid, just to give you an idea. But all of those were real asteroids that we've measured in outer space, and we know the orbits around the sun. There's about a million that we're keeping track of. Just a few. Meanwhile, they are uh, broken up. They stay as a belt, and they don't really combine into anything bigger because of the bully of the solar system that we're approaching, Jupiter. So gravity from Jupiter does prevent anything from in the asteroid belt from forming a planet. So the question would be, there's so much in there, why didn't it make a planet? Jupiter's preventing it. But Jupiter is pretty exciting. Here we go. So Jupiter is in fact the largest planet. You can fit a thousand Earths inside Jupiter and it's about 300 times the mass of the Earth, uh, which means that actually its density is about a fifth of the Earth. Um, so even though it's extremely large and extremely massive, there's a lot of stuff in there, its density is still less than Earth because it's mostly made of gas. So you'll notice on Jupiter, there are all these lines along there. And all those lines are basically weather patterns. And we have the same sort of thing on Earth, and that comes because of the rotation. So when you have a bunch of gas and you've got it rotating and you've got a heat source, the gas is gonna start moving around and you end up with these belts. And I think we can take a look at what that looks like on Earth, yeah? Yeah, let's compare uh, the belts and bands, the zones on Jupiter to that of ones on Earth. So we've made this little graphic here comparing the two. There it is. So you can see the way the clouds are moving up on Earth, that there are in fact those same types of belts that there are on Jupiter. But Jupiter has a lot more. That's because it is much larger and it's rotating much faster. It only takes 10 hours for Jupiter, which is so much more big than Earth, to rotate, which means that there's a lot more mixing going on there and a lot more happening, um, which leads to a lot more belts and a lot more pronounced belts. So you'll notice down there, the great red spot you may have heard of the Great Red Spot. It's a storm on Jupiter. It's been going for at least 300 years since Galileo was looking at Jupiter and his telescope, um, which means it was probably going on for a lot longer than that. Um, and the question would be, okay, so it's a storm. We have those on Earth as well. We have hurricanes, but hurricanes don't seem to last that long. And the reason that they last so long on Jupiter is because there isn't a solid surface on Jupiter. So. Whenever we have a hurricane, it usually comes across the water and it hits land, causes a bunch of issues, and then goes away. But here, there isn't any land. There's no friction to stop that from happening. So you get these storms that last a really, really long time, hundreds of years in the case of this great red spot, um, which is actually shrinking. So it might go away. Yeah, the great red spot has shrunk by about 30% uh, in 30 years. So maybe if it's 1% a year, we might lose it in the next 100 years. RIP the great red spot. But for now, it's still going strong. Uh, we've got a question. I would like to know, will perseverance do the same thing as curiosity? Um, so it's more of an expansion of curiosity. Um, so it's just more exploration, uh, getting more information than Curiosity got. Also, by going to a different place on Mars, you get more information. Um, if you imagine you sent someone to explore Earth and they only dropped in Cincinnati and Jakarta, and then you were like, okay, well, we know everything about Earth. You, you don't. So we want to send more things, even if they do a lot of the same stuff. Um, but there is more that Perseverance will be doing. But it will be a lot of the same things. We've got... Everett, who would like to know, why do bands go in different directions? So some of the gases are higher and lower and they're being blown in different directions by this pressure gradient. And that's what's going on there. There's also um, forces that happen because it's spinning. Yeah, the main force is the Cori Coriolis force. And since mm -hmm. Jupiter spins two and a half times faster than the Earth spins, um, it allows it to form many more bands and belts uh, that are then shearing against each other than on Earth. In the graphic we showed, Earth only had, say, three, a polar, a Hadley cell, and uh, a temperate zone. Well, three and three, six, yeah. Yeah, so three in the northern hemisphere, three in the southern. And Jupiter, you can see, has many, many more because it's spinning so much faster. And it's all atmosphere, pretty much. 
Jupiter is pretty much all atmosphere. It's all gas. Uh, but as you get lower and lower down into Jupiter, it's mostly made of hydrogen and helium. Those colors come from like ammonium and methane. Um, as you get further and further in, there's more and more pressure. It's more and more dense. Um, and it eventually starts turning into potentially a liquid hydrogen core. There might be a rocky core. It's up for debate. There are still mysteries out there, even with things as close to us as other planets. Um, so when Nick flew in and we got to see Jupiter all around us, all pretty like that, if you were to actually try flying into Jupiter, that's not what you would see. What would happen is your spacecraft would end up getting crushed as you go further and further in. So the same way that we have to make special submarines to go down in the ocean, we would have to make an impossible spacecraft to get anywhere near very far on Jupiter. So let's head to our next planet, our flashiest planet, in my opinion. Well, so we Jupiter might be the biggest. We can't leave Jupiter without first mentioning all of its oh. moons. Yes, Jupiter has a lot of moons. It's got like 79 moons. Many of them captured asteroids. Yes. So we've got... Ariel would like to know, could a spacecraft fly into Jupiter? Um, no. So again, because of the pressure, it'd be crushed. Um, it also has like metallic liquid and it's too hot in the middle. So it wouldn't get very far. As neat as it would be to be able to send a spacecraft in there and really get a lot of information, it just wouldn't survive. So we've got Saturn over here. So Saturn actually does have more moons than Jupiter we've found. Uh, but what's really neat about Saturn is, oh, yeah, there they are. There's a lot. In fact, they're all named after titans, different mythological titans, whether it's Norse mythology or Greek mythology. Uh, that's, of course, the largest one is known as Titan. How original. Yeah, so, so all of Saturn's moons, like I said, uh, named after titans. All of Jupiter's moons are named after um, women who had relationships with Jupiter or Zeus. And then you have Uranus, and all the moons are named after Shakespeare characters around Uranus. So there are some themes. So Saturn's got its rings um, that are gorgeous, and they might look like they're a solid object, but what they actually are, um, Nick will show us as we get closer in there, are a bunch of chunks of rock and mostly ice. And that's the reason it's so reflective. If you've ever been outside when it snows and you think, well, it's cold outside, why would I need my sunglasses? But the sun just goes right off that snow and blinds you. That's the same deal that's happening over here. It's really, really reflective. Um, and that's why they're so bright. And it's all just little chunks of ice. And by little chunks, I mean little by like astronomy terms, they're about as big as a refrigerator. So it's not something you'd wanna, I don't know, fight or punch, but <laughs> I mean, I don't know who's punching rocks. <laughs> You could melt them into a nice glass of water to drink. That's fair, that's true. So Saturn's rings are really, really thin and they look really thin from afar. And over here, it looks like they're kind of thick, but actually if you were to, sorry, take it to scale with a piece of paper like this, if this was all of Saturn's rings going across here, this piece of paper would be too thick. So it's thinner than that piece of paper. So another interesting thing about Saturn, um, it is actually nearly as big as Jupiter. It's about 80% of Jupiter's size. However, it only has about a third of the mass. That means that its density, the amount of stuff there in however much space is really, really low. In fact, it's lower than water, which means if you had like a giant bathtub and you put Saturn in it, it would float. Now, if you include the ring, Saturn is larger than Jupiter, uh, but true. we usually don't include ring systems in planets. And there actually are um, more than Saturn's ring systems. All the gas giants do have rings. Uh, Saturn just really took the cake with those. Now, one of the questions is how much ice is there around Saturn? Well, if you were to combine all of you to sweep up all the things, it would only form something like the size of a few moons. Um, and those moons, of course, get torn apart and recombined and torn apart and recombined numerous times over the history of Saturn. And uh, so I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I know exactly how much there is. It's probably less than expected. Um, so let's go ahead and actually, since we're here by Saturn, Saturn has a really interesting moon. So let's just take a really quick look at Titan that Nick mentioned earlier. And the reason that we find Titan so interesting is because it actually has an atmosphere. 
most moons in the solar system have very, very thin atmospheres or no atmosphere at all to speak of. So the fact that Titan has an atmosphere twice as thick as the Earth's makes it especially interesting. So Titan not only has an atmosphere, it also has, of course, weather, and it also has lakes. So there are liquid lakes and rivers and such there. But unfortunately, they're not water. <laughs> they they're are, methane. yes, sorry, they are liquid methane. So you wouldn't really want to go for a swim <laughs> in a lake on Titan. They're very uh, but, cold, about yes. 90 Kelvin. So it's about 150 degrees above absolute zero, 160 degrees. So you would be frozen, not good. <laughs> But uh, there's actually a mission that's going to be sent out here to Titan um, in the mid 2020s. Um, we did send a spacecraft down there one time, um, the Huygens probe, and it basically went into the atmosphere, through the clouds, took some pictures, and then crashed as it was supposed to. So there's the actual surface of Titan. Um, it's the only moon outside our own that we've sent any sort of lander. In fact, I think it's the furthest lander that we've ever sent. Yeah, it's worth noting that when it landed, it found that the surface was slightly squishy, which was surprising. So I think that uh, while the ice on Titan is as hard as granite, oh, here, I thought we'd have some pictures to show, but I guess not. Well, uh, the ice is as hard as granite. They think that maybe some of the methane was leaking into uh, the ground and making it maybe a little bit spongy. Yep. So let's go ahead and take a look at our next planet in the solar system which is Uranus. Here we go. Uranus, you can tell, very bland, but it has that beautiful teal color. And there's some white clouds, some dark clouds around it. And this teal color is brought to it by the methane in its atmosphere, just coloring it. And uh, those white clouds are kind of the same as the water clouds that you'd find on Earth. So uh, like Nick said, Uranus looks a little bit bland, um, but it is really interesting. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about Uranus is the fact that it is on its side. It's tilted about 98 degrees. So don't be fooled by our orientation in space. It actually is tipped over. And best way to illustrate this is to fly out and compare it to the rest of the solar system. So we'll fly out here again, um, and we'll make Uranus bigger when we're out there so that you can see. Here we go, let's fly away, and let's start making it much, much, much bigger. Woo. Here we are gonna make a Uranus about 40,000 times larger than it should be. And now we can see how it's not up and down along with the rest of the, the flat plane of the solar system, but it's tipped on its side. So most planets do have, or all planets do have some sort of tilt. Some of them are just barely tilted. The Earth is tilted about 23 and a half degrees. Uranus, like I said, is tilted about 98 degrees, which is completely ridiculous. And the reason we think that is, is because it was likely whacked by something earlier on in its formation. And we have a really neat animation of how that might have looked. We've got a question. Um, I mean, would like to know, can it rain diamonds on Uranus and Neptune? And the answer is yes. So here's, ooh, yes. So here is um, an animation of what it might have looked like to have had something that large run into Uranus that might have tilted it that far around. So Uranus um, is a gas giant. So you can see that it looks a little bit different than if we were to throw rocks at each other. And that's likely what tilted Uranus. Um, but yeah, so raining Neptune or raining Neptunes on diamonds, yes, raining diamonds on Uranus and Neptune. Um, there is high pressure and a lot of methane, so that can happen. Yeah, so the carbon in the atmosphere would be mm -hmm. able to uh, la make a lattice, and the pressure would allow it to form something as hard as diamonds. And then, of course, it would be kind of like hail falling out of the atmosphere, fa falling into deeper into the planet. Be some painful hail. Yeah, so, but I wouldn't mind getting whacked with that. It would pay for the medical cost itself. Would it though? <laughs> um, so we've got a question of uh, Sonic would like to know what decides a planet's tilt. So we're not entirely sure. We weren't really there to see what made it tilted. Um, we're 
our most likely explanation is collisions like that. Um, in the planet of, uh, in the case of Venus, um, something whacked it enough that it went all the way upside down. So sometimes people say that it rotates backwards, um, but really we like to say that it's upside down. It's around 180 something degrees tilted there. Um, and like I said, you know, the earth is about 23 and a half degrees. Uh, they all have different tilts and it is quite likely that it came from collisions. It could be something else. Um, again, no one was really there when this was all made. So it's a lot of um, conjecture, math, and looking at evidence of the way other things work. Of course, you can tell the pattern. Uh, they're all flat in a plane, and they're all going around in the same direction. So if you were to base it off of the sun, then the sun is like the, the average of all that stuff put together. So we, comp we compare the tilts of each planet to the tilt of the sun and to its aggregate motion. And so uh, we can say, well, some things didn't have enough things collide with them to average out, and some had one too many, like Uranus and Venus, which tended to throw them off in the wrong direction. But if we compare them to the sun, uh, we can say the Earth is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. And um, Earth was whacked by something early on, too. That's what made the moon, in fact. Something about the size of Mars ran into Earth, and all the stuff that got blown off ended up turning into or uh, becoming the moon. Uh, we have a question from Kevin who would like to know how many places can support microbial life? Um, we don't really know. Um, it kind of depends <laughs> um, on your opinion of quite a few. So quite a few, maybe none. Um, some really good candidates would be like Titan, um, Europa be another good one. That's a moon of Jupiter that has a subsurface ocean. Um, Io is another moon of Jupiter. That could be um, a decent candidate. And of course, Earth has microbial life. Mars might. Oh, it's hi, Europa. Really <laughs> Europa, Io. Io, yeah. The great um, word. So our understanding and definition of life comes from exactly one data point, Earth. <laughs> so our entire understanding of life comes from how it works on Earth. So when we look for life other places, we look for the things that life needs here on Earth. Um, which is why places like Mars seem nice because there's potential water, there's heat from the sun that could do something. Europa is a really good candidate because of that ocean. So there's a bunch of water, which life needs. Um, there is a heat source um, that's from like tidal heating from Jupiter. That's what keeps the subsurface ocean warm enough to be water instead of frozen over when it's that far away from the sun. Um, so what we really do look for is things that make sense for life on Earth. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be life that works differently. We just wouldn't know what to look for. So we'll keep an eye out. I think before we answer any more questions, we should wrap this up with our last yes. planet. Yes. Let's go ahead and head to Neptune, our last planet. Neptune's a lot like Uranus, but it's not sideways. <laughs> It's also blue because of methane. So Uranus and Neptune have only ever had one spacecraft visit, Voyager 2, and that's it. So those are our only flybys. Um, a lot of our pictures of them come from the Voyager 2 um, mission there, or from telescope data from Earth, and that's about as much as, as we've got for them. So Neptune also has rings. It also has a lot of moons. The gas giants have a lot of moons. Um, again, a lot of them are just captured junk in rocks. And Neptune also has a storm on it, kind of like Jupiter's right there. You can see it, the great dark spot. And last time we were there, it was there and we haven't been back since. So it might still be there, it might not. Yeah, recent observations with the Hubble Space Telescope show conflicting information. Some say that it uh, disappeared a number of years ago, and some say that they, they now see a new storm on Neptune. Maybe it's the old storm. It's hard to tell. It both exists and does not exist. We just don't know. But let's go ahead and head out to everyone's favorite dwarf planet. So bye, Neptune. Anytime I'm in the planetarium and I start pointing out all the planets and I talk through them, it doesn't matter how old the audience is, even if it's first graders, they start yelling out, Pluto, Pluto, Pluto. So Pluto hasn't been a planet for quite some time, but it's still a fan favorite. We can take a look at uh, why Pluto isn't really considered a planet anymore. If we played a game of which one of these is not like the others, 
I don't know about you, but I'd pick Pluto. <laughs> Isn't quite like the others. Um, it's not found within the plane of our solar system. Um, it is a lot smaller, but the uh, things that make something a planet, it has to be spherical. So it has to have enough gravity to hold into a sphere like that. It has to go around the sun. That's why moons aren't considered planets. Um, it also has to have enough gravity to have cleared its orbit. So it has to be like the most gravitationally dominant thing in the orbit there. Which it has definitely not done if you compare it it's to not. the 3,000 objects that orbit the sun out here, 3,600 that we've discovered. Pluto is just one of many of what we call the Kuiper Belt. Sounds like Viper, the Kuiper Belt. It's like a second asteroid belt that we've only just started discovering, and Pluto was the first one that we adopted into the family of planets. But really, it didn't seem to belong in our family. It was part of this family all along. It just took us 100 years to find the other members. As we started finding more and more and more planets, we kind of started wondering, OK, what is a planet? Um, and like Nick said, we started finding more things like Pluto. So we ended up having a different classification. So let's go ahead and zoom in on Pluto if we can. It'll be hard to find it because it's so small. It's smaller than our moon. So we've got a couple of questions while we're going in. Um, we've got Ariel would like to know, so north for a planet is relative to each planet or determined by magnetic field. So north already is just kind of something we made up for directions. Uh, but it's usually aligned to the rotation axis, so wherever it's rotating around. Uh, but sometimes it's off, like Uranus. Um, it just kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, but magnetic north is dependent on a magnetic field, which not every planet has a magnetic field. Um, I mean, it says literally everyone, bring Pluto back. NASA says no. It's still there, it's still there, it's still a planet, it's just a dwarf planet. Pluto's okay, Pluto's doing fine. Um, so I believe it was last week that we were talking about the Hubble Space Telescope, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and we shared some pictures of Pluto from Hubble. Yeah, so let's compare that to what we're seeing here. Yes. Where is it? And while we're looking for that, Sonic would like to know how many years is Sedna's orbit? So Sedna's orbit is 11,408 years. <laughs> it's, it's a long year, kind of like 2020. So here we've got Pluto. So what we're showing right now on Pluto is um, pictures from the New Horizons mission in 2015. So Pluto being extremely far from the sun is very, very cold. Found it. Oh, you found it. Awesome. That's oh, what it's it used beautiful. To like. <laughs> it's gorgeous. There's Pluto. So that's Pluto according to the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you weren't here last week at all, um, a lot of people kind of wonder why does it look so bad if the Hubble Space Telescope takes such gorgeous pictures of things really, really far away and Pluto's so close, why is this pixels? It's because Pluto's so tiny and the things that Hubble's taking pictures of far away are so big. Hubble can't really take a picture of a planet that's that far away. Or a not planet. Or a not planet, a dwarf planet. If it was so. just a little bit bigger, we could solve all these problems. <laughs> it's just a little bit bigger. So it was really exciting when we got to get the New Horizons mission um, out there in 2015 to get these pictures. This is why we send spacecraft to other planets so that we can get this amazing data, these amazing pictures um, that we can't get from telescopes at home. And there's Pluto's heart thing. That heart is actually a glacier, uh, but not the same kind of glacier that you uh, would see here on Earth. That glacier is made of frozen nitrogen. So it's like the air that you breathe is mm -hmm. mostly nitrogen. So imagine that freezing and then forming these weird ice shells. Yeah, so it's, it's about negative 380 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 230 degrees Celsius over here on Pluto, which is why it can freeze that much. But you'll notice that it is smooth. And you remember we saw things like Mercury, and if you think about the moon, all those craters, and Pluto doesn't have as many, doesn't mean that it wasn't whacked. It just means that it was resurfaced. Uh, so that glacier might not be entirely fully solid, uh, which means that it smooths out. 
So Shelly would like to know, what did New Horizons do after Pluto? So a couple of things. When it first went past Pluto, it took some really cool backlit pictures that showed the atmosphere. Yeah, I can bring some of those up. Is that one here? Here's a better one. Here we go. So we didn't really expect Pluto to have terribly much of an atmosphere, but it does. It's pretty hazy layered like that. You can see that there are layers to it. So that was a really exciting find for planetary scientists. So that was the first thing New Horizons did after going past Pluto. Um, it did also take some pictures of its moon, um, Charon. Sharon, it found, looked very, very weird. They found an enormous crack going through it, like a huge valley, and that the top was uh, oranger there looks kind of squish. So even Sharon doesn't look quite too circular. It's like having a really bad day. It's like a cantaloupe that was left on its side for too long. What a shame. Um, so then after seeing both Pluto and Sharon, what it did is it went to another Kuiper Belt object like Nick was talking about before. Uh, this one is called Arakoth now. It actually wasn't even discovered until after um, New Horizons was launched. Here it is. There's Arakoth. It is what's called a contact binary. So there were two objects that crashed into each other and now they're stuck together. So contact, they're touching, binary, two. It looks kind of like a snowman. It does look like a snowman. Or a rubber duck, but a different kind of rubber duck than the ones we're used to. I'd say like a rubber chicken, but like squished. Maybe a bowling pin? Bowling pin. It's a bowling pin. Yeah. We're going to stand by that. Bowling pin, Fisk Planetarium, circa 2020. And New Horizons is just going from there. <laughs> if it happens to come near some other objects, maybe it'll take some pictures, but the objects are few and far between, like the asteroid belt, but even more. So there is our solar system. Let's go ahead and zoom out and just take a look at what we've seen and get a good family portrait of the solar system. There we go. We'll throw Pluto in just for good measure. But That's let's right. not forget some of the asteroids, like maybe Ceres and Eris. Mm -hmm. I also like Haumea and Maki Maki, and maybe I'll throw in Sedna too. Where does it stop? <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't. <laughs> so we've got all our planets. We've got our dwarf planets. Remember, we had our asteroid belt. We talked about the Kuiper belt, which is a bunch of objects outside the orbit of Neptune. We've got our sun in the middle there. We also have what's called the Oort cloud, which is just a cloud of other junk. So like comets come from the Oort cloud. Very distant, diffused thing with maybe as many as a trillion comets spread of now a light year in radius from the sun out into space, halfway to the nearest star, perhaps. Everything in our solar system we spent so much time studying is within just a very small parcel of space. So although things feel really, really far away, they're actually much closer. Here's our Oort cloud happening over here. So this is our little neighborhood of the universe, our little cul-de-sac. So it feels like time for questions. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and toss them there in the chat. And do we have uh, slow mode on still, Nick? Probably. Here, let's see if we can speed it up a bit. All right, chat, we're going to change it to five seconds. And let's try not to hit the earth when we fly back. Yes, let's not, let's not crash into the earth. Ah. So we've got, Shelly wanted to know how long does it take for us to get data back from missions like New Horizons that go way out to the solar system? Awesome question. So um, the Deep Space Network, okay, so it takes about 18 hours to talk to the Voyagers, which are the furthest thing out. Um, as far as talking to New Horizons, Nick, do you remember? New Horizons. 
I think New Horizons is something like five to six hours away in terms of light travel time. But of course, it has such a very slow communication speed that it would take a very long time for its communications to reach us. And uh, to give you an idea, though, of how far away that is, um, New Horizons launched in 2006. So it took like nine years to get to Pluto, um, just chugging along physically. There's New Horizons. There's New Horizons. Let's come back home. Yeah, it took nine and a half years. We've got a question. When's the next meteor shower? That's a great uh, question. There's... One coming up? There was one just a few days ago. Yeah. Um, but if you go outside at night and just look into the sky for long enough, you'll eventually see something. It's a constant. Yeah. That's what they call, uh, yeah, well just, just look up in the sky. You'll always see it. You'll always be able to see a... Uh, a Try to be in a place with not much light, though. <laughs> yeah, that's why I call the Conant constant, because it's just you just look up, and you'll always see something interesting happening. So the next meteor shower, let's see. Oh, so while we're looking into that, I see um, Katie would like to know what happens when you take a thimble full of neutron star material and drop it on the earth. Or I guess Jeremy would like to know that. So if you took, so a neutron star, and we're gonna talk more next week actually about uh, the sun and stars in general. So we'll learn more about neutron stars. What those are are remnants from dead stars. And the matter is so compact, so dense, that if you took something about a thimble or about a teaspoon, it would weigh as much as Mount Everest does here on Earth. So I don't think it would go over very well if we just took a thimble and dropped it on the surface of the Earth because it would be so small, so dense. It would create quite a problem. I think the next meteor shower is the Eta Lyrids on May 10th. Um, it was a pretty weak shower. Yeah. We've got uh, the Aquarians on May 28th as well. Uh, but yeah, definitely make sure that you're somewhere dark if you would like to um, see those. The Aquarians are going to be about 55 of them per hour. So if you do get to see those, go see them and tell us about them. All right. Do we have any other questions? If so, drop them in quick. So we've got, okay, so Shelly wanted to know how the solar system was originally formed. So there's a lot of gas and dust out there in the universe and gas and dust is what makes up everything. There was a huge cloud of this and it starts contracting due to gravity. Ooh, here's a great one. This is the, is it the Eagle Nebula? This is the Pillars of Creation. Yes. Eagle Nebula. So these are places where stars um, are made and where stars are made is where planets are made. That's where planetary systems are made. Um, so you have this huge cloud of gas and dust and they start coming together uh, due to gravity. And as they come together, it starts spinning. So even just a little spin turns into a really big spin as you contract. So the same way that you have an ice skater, puts their arms out, they're spinning, pulls them in, and they start spinning way too fast to even see. <laughs> so that's the same deal. As it comes down, it starts spinning faster and faster. And the center of it is what eventually becomes a star. And again, next week, we're going to be talking a lot more about stars and how they're made and what their life cycles are. Um, and the outer parts start coming together in a disc. So like when you have pizza dough, you see people make pizza and they throw it up and it starts flattening out. That's what happens there. And ooh, you can see here, this is what's called a protoplanetary disk. It's a disk because, well, it's a disk, protoplanetary, so early planets. And you can see those rings there are where planets are starting to form and gathering all the material to start making planets. And then Kevin would like to see all the planets one last time. Let's see if we can do that. Mercury, followed by Venus. Now see them like, can we see them all together or just oh, see them all, all together? Oh, we can go through this. <laughs> Mars. Mars. Of course, we saw the Earth for quite some yes. time. Uh, Jupiter. How do we get to Jupiter? How do we get to Jupiter? Teleport. Excellent. 
Saturn. Here we go. There it is. Then, uh, Denise would like to know which is your favorite. Oh man, which is my favorite? Nick, what's your favorite while I try to think? Earth, by far. <laughs> I wouldn't be anywhere without Earth. But that's the cop out answer. My favorite is Neptune. That's a cop out answer. <laughs> Neptune is this beautiful blue planet. We know so little about it, only having visited it ever once. I think that Neptune has a lot of things to be explored and it will be always be the most difficult planet to get to. It's my favorite planet in elementary school, actually, Neptune. Um, I really like Venus, actually. I like that it tries to destroy all our spacecrafts. I respect that. All right, so that is all the time we have. Thank you all so much for joining us for this. I hope you had fun because we definitely had fun. Um, don't forget to like the video and subscribe so that you can get notifications on more videos like these. Next week, Tara and Parker are going to be talking about, like I said, the sun and stars. I have to show them all the planets one last time. All the planets one last time. Here we go. Zip, zip, zip. We didn't talk about much about the sun this time because we're covering it next week, but the sun is, of course, the reason we call it the soul system. All right. Awesome. Um, William, from everyone here at FISC, thank you so much. You have a good one. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. See you next week.